title of my presentation, Modernise or Die, yeah, it's a pretty dramatic statement. It was intentionally dramatic, so I thought long and hard about what I was going to call my report. You don't get asked to do government reviews that often, so it was a massively important opportunity to land a message in a way that perhaps people hadn't been bold enough to do before. And uh, I think it, it's had the desired effect. I think it's created, as David said, it's created a conversation, a conversation that I haven't seen before in the UK around our industry. Uh, not everyone agrees with what I say, and I think that's healthy. I think it's all about people coming to their own conclusions as to what the future looks like um, for our industry, but I'm pretty certain that we do need to do things differently. And uh, I think in particular in respects of housing delivery, in the UK, we have some very particular challenges around housing delivery, um, but they're not dissimilar from what you have here in Australia as well. Uh, and that also spans into infrastructure, both in terms of social infrastructure, schools, hospitals, etc., but also economic infrastructure, such as roads and railways. So there's some critical elements that really um, go to the heart of economic growth uh, and national economic welfare that our construction industry is absolutely front and centre on being able to deliver. So, for me, it is about doing things differently. So why do we need to do things differently? My assertion is that business as usual is no longer an option for us. And I think you may feel we've been here before, we've had messages that we have to change, otherwise we're facing into the abyss. Um, but we've always reverted to type. And there's been some points in the past where there's been sort of calls to action and nothing's really come of it. My view is that that is different now, and I'll come on to why I think that is in a second. I think the problems, as I've said, that we've got in the UK are largely shared with what you have here in Australia. There's a few nuances in the UK market that make us unique, and actually we have some worse issues in some respects than you have here in Australia. But by and large, what I see here, I was, and I was lucky enough to speak at the Prefab Oz conference in Melbourne back in last September, so I met quite a few um, people from the industry here and just got a sense, a temperature check of what's happening uh, here in Australia and it verified my assumption that we have a large degree of commonality around some very generic issues. So just a reminder of context, um, perhaps just before I get into the, the detail of this, so certainly as I just alluded to from a UK construction perspective we've had some previous rallying calls, some calls to arms on the back of previous reports going back to in this instance sharing Four reports from 1994, I think the first one was Sir Michael Latham constructing the team, all about construction's woes, particularly around collaborative working or lack of, the inability to think in an integrated way. That was then developed in 1998 by Sir John Egan in Rethinking Construction, who come from an automotive background. He led Jaguar in the UK and arrived at British Airports Authority thinking, what the hell is this? How can an industry be so different from where he'd come from in automotive? And wrote that report on the back of it, um, created a, um, a sense of activity, sense of urgency, and then it dissipated. And we went back to type in the UK. And then Andrew Walsenholm wrote a report, who's the current co-chair of the uh, Construction Leadership Council in the UK, and he's the chief executive of Crossrail, Europe's largest infrastructure project, wrote uh, a report, Never Waste a Good Crisis, which I thought was a good title. And uh, guess what? We wasted a good crisis because from 2009, I think it was when he wrote that, when we were in the depths of the financial crisis, and he said, look, we have an opportunity here to do things in a slightly different way. We didn't, and we moved on and we reverted to type. And then I added to that mix in 2016 with my report and the specific terms of reference I had from the UK government was to look at the UK construction labour model. So it wasn't necessarily a report around things like collaboration. It wasn't a report on BIM and digital, but it was a report on the labour model and effectively the resource means by which the industry delivers and what challenges that represented to UK government around um, two things. Firstly, housing delivery. So my report was co-sponsored by the housing ministry, um, but also training and skills. So it was the other co-sponsor was the government department responsible for skills and training in the UK. So the focus is very much around the sustainability of our delivery model we have a focus on resources, a focus on the physical means of how we build without perhaps some of the broader issues that have been picked up in these previous reports. But saying that, my report covers and recovers a lot of old ground and I identify in my report what I call 10 symptoms of failure and you'll recognise hopefully many of these. They're things that we've covered ad infinitum before in our industry. Low productivity, 
fragmentation, subcontracting, adversarial contractual behaviours, low margins, lack of R&D, etc, etc, etc. So nothing new there, and as I say, have been picked up many times before. Uh, there's only nine symptoms there. It's the tenth one that, for me, I picked up and thought, you know what, this feels different this time. This feels like something's going on that I haven't seen before and haven't read in the previous reports and is actually just a time issue in terms of where we are in the market. And that's that one there, workforce size and demographics. So coming back to the, the exam question I, I'd been asked by government around the labour model, what was becoming clear in the early part of my evidence uh, building and, um, and research into my report in, in early 2016 was that we were starting to enter a period where the workforce um, and its shape looked very different to perhaps what we've seen in the past. And there's two elements to that. One is we have an ageing workforce in the UK and that ageing profile is, about, is starting to kick in now over the next 10 years we are going to see an erosion of our workforce where we have more people retiring every year than entering our industry. Ageing is not unique to the UK, so it's, an, it's also an issue for Australia and other economies and probably certainly some other Western economies have more advanced issues in this regard, particularly Japan, which is probably a few years ahead of where the UK is. But if Japan's any evidence of where it takes them, um, they've lost a third of their workforce in the last 15 years through ageing and Japan's construction industry is now struggling to deal with basic infrastructure needs. It's struggling to build the Tokyo Olympics and it's because the ageing workforce is starting to kick in. So that's what's coming now in the UK. You'll have a, a version of that here in Australia. We have an added complication in the UK around Brexit. So we've decided to leave the European Union. Whether that's right or wrong is for people to debate, but it's a reality for our industry where in London, half of all of our workers are non-UK. 24% of them are from the EU. So all of a sudden we have an added risk around workforce erosion and capacity constraint and, re and reduction beyond the, the structural shift in our demographics. This is an, a, a migrant worker dependency issue that means that it elevates this to sort of DEFCON 1, if you like, in, in government thinking. And government's very, very focused at the moment in the UK in trying to deal with future-proofing those sectors that are susceptible to Brexit impact. And I think that's a good thing for construction and actually it's something that has wider application, as I say, for um, countries that are not subject to the same issues that we have around Brexit. There's an issue about sustainable economies, there's an issue around sustainable workforce, which I think is a truism for wherever you are. And really what I'd conclude in saying in that regard is that the prognosis that I saw from looking at all those issues, particularly this workforce resiliency issue, is a declining future industry resiliency. So what, what's clear to me and what I've seen over 30 years of being in the construction industry and having gone through three major cycles in, in the UK is we are a cyclical industry. We are, we are reliant on capex, we are reliant on discretionary spend, whether it's government spend or it's corporate occupiers or developers. Um, and if there's an economic downturn, construction is hardest hit. And the peaks and troughs of our activity is highly amplified from background economic cycles. But we've been very, very resilient. And part of all of the other symptoms you see down um, written around there around fragmentation, around low R&D, is the fact that we've shaped ourselves as an industry to ride those cycles of boom and bust. That's where subcontracting has come from. That's from where the, the lack of willingness to invest in the future to R&D, to look at future-proofing, is all about uh, a way of thinking which is characterised by short-termism. Short Think about living through this current wave and just prepare for the next one. It's not about long-term thinking because our industry um, is very, very volatile. And that resiliency, the ability to shed labour and then regain labour in an upturn, it is what has saved our industry in terms of being able to deliver in highly volatile economic conditions um, my prognosis is that will be increasingly difficult going forward, particularly in the UK with Brexit, but I think it's also, as I say, it's an international generic issue, um, particularly around the ageing part of our workforce, that the ability to bring new people in, particularly with um, skills, this isn't just about headcount, this is about the calibre of our workforce as well with the right skills, is going to be more under pressure than we've ever seen it in the past. So actually the biggest problem is probably still in front of us. And it's those people who see that and have the foresight to see what's coming that will get ahead of the game here and not wait for it to creep up and, and actually be on them. 
And it's for that reason that I use this term quite a lot, but I do truly believe we have a burning platform. It's driven by basic resources, by input resources into what is a very labour intensive industry that is reliant on a number of people to produce a certain level of output based on current modes of working, and I'll come on to that, doesn't look sustainable in the long run anymore. And this also brings in one of the 10 symptoms there that I didn't um, mention just now was the image of our industry. So we have a problem in construction attracting high calibre new recruits. Kids nowadays are not necessarily wanting to enter our industry as an aspirational career path, which I think is a damn shame because it is for me certainly the best industry to work in. We don't have enough people out there going into schools early enough, selling the messages to how fulfilling our industry can be, how exciting it can be, because actually school teachers and careers advisors are putting kids off. And that's actively what's happening in the UK, I'm not sure about Australia, but we see our industry as being the bottom of the pile. Um, people are often ending up in construction by default. Kids nowadays want to be involved in industries that are technology dependent, that are not about working on a cold, wet building site in the freezing cold. Um, this is about offering a different proposition to kids to make our industry more attractive. So that declining workforce through demographics is offset by bringing more people into our industry, actually of a high caliber as well. We want good people in our industry. It's not just about hoovering people off the streets. We're not going to change our industry unless we actually increase the caliber of who's in it. So just to build on that prognosis debate, as I've said, skilled construction labor, in my view, is now in long-term structural decline, not cyclical decline, structural decline. So the trend line through it is downwards around the headcount in many Western economies. Quality of the new labor force coming in is being reduced. We're diluting the average competence level in our industry. And that's a combination of uh, the courses that are being run. And it's interesting to have some conversations with Shunef and David and the, and the team earlier about what Western Sydney University and Centre for Smart Modern Construction is doing around just really testing what industry needs, not just here and now, but in the future. It's such an important debate about future-proofing. We can't keep doing what we're doing because actually even now there's a disconnect between what some institutions, FE and HE are producing relative to what industry actually needs and more importantly what industry thinks it needs because there's a disconnect there as well in terms of the future. We have an increase in reliance on a small and smaller pool of experienced labour who are responsible for that mentoring and training and bringing people on and that sharing of knowledge. That's a double-edged sword because some of the people that have been 30, 40 years in the industry, actually some of those experiences might not be relevant in the future. So you have to temper some of the experiential learning with the fact that things are going to change. But you need, you always need the experiential learning and it's, it's more and more under stress now than I've ever, I've ever seen around the fact that these people are retiring quicker than we've seen and uh, are being stretched more and more in terms of doing the day job but passing on their learning as well. We also have... Um, a major issue at the moment um, with main contractors, tier ones if you like, large businesses that then rely on subcontractors to do delivery. Uh, it's quite clear in the UK that many main contractors have lost control of their ability to deliver outcomes for clients because they're no longer in control of their subcontractors. And that seems quite a sweeping statement, but um, I truly believe that is the case. I truly believe what I've seen in the last five years, particularly the last two or three years, is a state of affairs I have never seen before in my career. And it's become a talking point, a talking point at a level that we, we haven't seen in the UK. And from talking to a few people here in Australia, there are some parallels and I'm offering to New Zealand actually next week. And I know there are parallels in New Zealand as well. And actually even worse, subcontractors are not even in control of their own workforce. This might be a UKism. So we have a highly casualised workforce. We don't have a unionised workforce in the UK. I know you have more of a unionised workforce here in Australia. We have a high level of self-employment. That has led to a position where the subcontractors who are responsible for doing physical work on site are increasingly not able to even tell you who's going to turn up for work the next morning. They have labour gangs that are roving jobs in the major cities of London, Manchester, Liverpool, just looking for the best price. And if they find a good price down the road at another site, they'll go to that site. To add to all of that, we have a problem with our designers. Architects and engineers have gradually become de-skilled. What I mean by that, and this is not a derogatory comment in the sense of people getting lazy or whatever, this is a structural change around procurement. So in the, in the UK, we've had a big change in over the last 25 years towards what we call design and build. 
where the design is completed by contractors. The client-led design team takes design up to a certain point and then it's passed over and it's more of a monitoring role, perhaps. And what that's meant is the design professions have split into two in the UK. You have good upfront client-side architects and engineers who can get you a planning consent and a permit. And then you've got others who've concentrated downstream in engineering, construction, design, detailed design that can be built. And there's very few businesses that span both. And what that's done is it's gradually de-skilled the number of people able to, to complete a design process from cradle to grave. And that's not a healthy thing to have. We also have a position where surveyors, QSs, and I'm, I'm a QS so I can say this um, without fear of having uh, a pop at another profession, this is uh, a real problem in that QSs now do not understand the true cost of things. Not at the level they did when I first came into the profession 30 years ago. There used to be a, a profession driven by understanding labour, plant materials, waste, productivity, effectiveness, efficiency. Now what it seems to be is more about just chasing numbers around a spreadsheet and making sure the markup supplied in the right place. And that is just not good enough. And actually it's perpetuated by the accreditation of some of the courses, certainly in the UK, um, moving away from understanding the nuts and bolts of what cost is driven by. And that is a big, big problem. We're seeing increased litigation and major project failures starting to rear their head. Again, some of this is cyclical, but I sense a structural shift around long-term move towards more litigation and adversarial outcomes. Um, and we're now seeing very clear evidence of commercial failures of business. And this is all down to the fact that more and more businesses are unable to hold the risk because the carrying of risk from one side of a transaction to another is what's doing the damage in our industry. The fragmented nature of throwing risk over the fence, accepting a risk premium, get pricing that risk premium, getting it wrong because you don't know how, who's going to turn up for site the next morning, go back to my anecdote, is now at a stage where businesses are suffering from that in real terms. And against all of that backdrop, which is pretty sobering, you now have the disruptors and new disruptive models coming into play. You see all of that thinking, well, this is a really ripe industry for change. I'm going to come in and disrupt it a bit. I'm going to come in and do something different. Mostly businesses that don't come from the construction industry. They might be tech-based, they might be manufacturing-based. They see big opportunity in construction. And what that leads to is challenging the status quo and actually, you know, if some of these models land, then it's just going to hop straight over the, the existing incumbents in the industry and that disruption could be a negative disruption rather than a positive disruption. I know I'm all for disruption, but what I don't want is for an industry to be negatively disrupted such that the industry is not able to evolve itself, because that's not, no one wants that, governments don't want that, the industry doesn't want it, the economy will suffer more. So you need, to, you need disruption to be positive, and I'm not sure at the moment what the nature of disruption is that's coming for our industry, but it's, it is coming. So just to put some of this in context around pricing, for instance. So I just mentioned cost and price, etc. This is a UK tender price index, um, which is published um, on a, a, a quarterly basis. So the red line is the, um, the cost index, the black line is the price index. Again, coming back to the fact what people sell things for is not necessarily the same as what the cost is. It's all market-led and it's demand-led. But what I'm suggesting is that the volatility around resource costs going forward, particularly labour, to an extent materials, if you're importing and you have currency um, exchange rate volatility, you're going to see a much more erratic pattern. And I've probably over-exaggerated that for visual effect, but the story is sound in terms of we're going to see cycles going down and up, but because of the inelasticity of labour supply, you're going to see the inability to ramp up labour in an upturn in the future. The rate at which labour price inflation increases will be a lot more dramatic than what we've seen at the moment. And I've heard here in Australia you've had some pretty dramatic labour price inflation of late. There's a lot more of that to come unless we change our models of delivery because labour scarcity is going to be calling the shots around the price of construction going forward. And if you put a regression line through it, it's going to go up, but it's going to go up at a steeper rate, which is all about supply and demand and resource scarcity. So just coming back to my report and this modernise or die challenge, and I addressed it to three parties. Clients, lots of what we try and do as an industry to change has to be client-led. We can do so much within the industry and push different ways of delivery, but for me, the biggest enabler of change is the industry being pulled in a different way by its clients. So I specifically called out clients as being a major enabler for change. I obviously talked about the industry itself, 
supply chain consultants, tier ones, tier twos, suppliers, everyone, and also government in terms of the government's role, not only as a client of the industry, but actually as a policy setter. And I, I talked about training and retaining new talent, homegrown talent. So with our Brexit challenge there, how do we get UK workers um, into our industry in greater numbers um, and keep them and not shed them in the next downturn, which is a problem we've had. How do we create those long-term career opportunities that look more um, um, aspirational than perhaps just ending up somewhere by default? Really importantly, how do we prepare to do more with less in the future? Because everything I'm saying to you here is setting the scene around the fact that we will not recruit our way out of this. I'd be very, very surprised. I'm 99.9% .9 certain that we will be able to recruit our way out of this problem we've got coming. So we need to be prepared to do more with less in the future. And to help us to do that, we need to be able to see new types of demand coming forward for different ways of constructing. This is starting to come back to the basic delivery model that we employ at the moment, a very labour intensive, traditionally based one. If we're going to break that cycle, we need to see a demand for something different. Coming back to push and pull, it needs to be a pull, a demand for something different from clients and their advisors. The advisors got a critical role to play here in terms of what advice they give their clients. Because if advisors are lazy and they're saying, actually, this is in the too difficult box, I'm not sure how this newfangled technology works, we'll just do what we did in the last job and we'll just do the last report and change the title, then we've got a bigger problem coming. So this is a challenge, not just to clients, but to their advisors as well to do the right thing. And if we can get that demand showing itself and the industry sees this demand for doing something differently, well, guess what? It then brings in an obvious benefits case for actually running the skills and training regimes, including HE and FE programs to support industry in starting to change the skills mix and looking at different ways in which we deliver, which fundamentally are less labour intensive. This is what this is really coming down to. It's a productivity led challenge to the industry to reform what we do and how we do it and the level of resource intensity and ultimately make us more productive. And, and if we can do that through offering a different type of skill set that's more attractive to the kids who want to come into our industry, we, it's a double-edged benefit. We improve productivity and we get more people in anyway. So there's high stakes here in terms of getting this right. But notwithstanding all of that, and that, as I say, is pretty depressing stuff, you know, will our industry really respond? Will clients respond to all of that? Um, that alone, You'd think, actually, on paper, people would get sit up and listen, but I'm not sure. Our track record is not very good around our industry reacting to all of that negative stimuli and sort of the rallying calls for doing something different. So what's interesting for me is, is actually discontent is now another driver that's starting to come into play at a level I have not seen before in, in my career. Uh, and maybe discontent could be the true father of progress here. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's two types of discontent that I see playing out at the moment, certainly from a UK perspective. These are newspaper website headlines, all in the last 10, 11 months in the UK, talking about large contractors making losses or no money. And that came to a head. Many of you will know what happened in January in the UK, where Carillion, the second biggest tier one contractor in the UK went into liquidation, didn't even go into administration, went straight into liquidation. Six months after a first profits warning, it just completely capitulated. And that headline there was from July. So we know the answer to that now. The issue now is who's next? And it will not stop at Carillion. I can assure you it will not stop at Carillion. So we now have discontent driven out of financial performance. We've gone through the biggest boom in construction for a generation in the last five, six years in, in the UK, and no one's making any money. And everyone's scratching their heads thinking, why? And it's back to the resourcing issue. It's back to the skills. It's back to the lack of control. It's back to the fact that the risks are not being shared on the basis that people can take that risk and actually be able to predict the outcome anymore. And Carillion is the obvious example of where that goes wrong at its extreme. And the skills issue you can debate in Carillion wasn't just a skills issue on the work site, it was a skills issue in the boardroom. And maybe that's a one-off, maybe it's not. Time will tell as to how many other businesses are out there, in the, not just in the UK, but internationally, who are run on a model predicated on what effectively is a Ponzi scheme. And that's the analogy many people have made now in the UK. The UK media, mainstream media, TV, radio, are all over this at the moment. And that's why I'm feeling a sense of spotlight on the industry that we haven't seen before. 
um, certainly in my career, as I said. And that's why the die in my Modernise or Die report has taken on another level of significance in the last couple of months. Because everyone's now seeing, like, I wasn't talking about the construction industry dying. We we're always going to have a construction industry. I was talking about just this. Individual businesses operating in the industry, you either modernise or you die. And die is a corporate failure, or you just wither on the vine. So this is one of the biggest examples you can get. I, and um, I have to say I didn't see this coming in October 2016 when I published my report as quickly as it's come. I saw it as a bit of a longer term burn and gradual illustration of structural failures in our business models. So Carillion has, has amplified and accelerated some of the change that's coming. And you know what, what's clear to me looking at some of the stats from here in Australia is that your construction industry is also a prime candidate for high levels of insolvencies. So the fragility of the model that we have in the UK, I think, is absolutely mirror imaged here in Australia. You have low levels of capitalisation. You have a, an industry highly reliant on cyclical output, boom and bust. So the fact that construction is the second biggest sector after all the sectors, all the other sectors, which is the high one there. So you're the biggest single sector um, standalone for insolvencies in Australia. Uh, and that pretty much mirrors what we've got in the UK as well shows you that this is all very fragile and any changes in structural shape of the industry in the background could make this a lot worse going forward. But there's also another level of discontent and that's about the quality of what we deliver. So again in the UK we've had a big big media interest in poor quality housing. So on the right um, Bovis Homes which is one of the top 10 house builders in the UK had a massive problem last year where they overextended their production and a, a bunch of consumers started to get activated around that on social media and pushed back and you know, went and saw the newspapers and went on TV and talked about poor quality home building, snagging, list, you know, lists of hundreds of pages of snagging, nothing getting rectified. And they, they effectively weaponized social media on a pushback against poor quality home building. All a function of skills. Bovis were using traditional techniques, lack of um, supervision, poor quality construction, signed off, under duress in some instances, nearly cost them their business. They're now on the road to recovery. They've put measures in place to get their production controls um, back in place, but that nearly took them to, into a, a failure point as well. It's not just an issue in private house building. On the left, that's a picture of a scheme called Orchard Village, which is a social housing project in London. It's about two and a half, three years old. It's been condemned, built traditionally. It's got a massive issue in terms of moisture, ingress, it's got mould, it's got poor air quality, it's probably going to get demolished. So this has become a, a raging issue in our industry around quality, quality of the outcome, particularly in house building because it's very emotive, probably more so than in building commercial property or infrastructure. It's also happening though in elements of social infrastructure, so we've had a big systemic failure in the schools programme in Scotland where a whole load of masonry was found to be built without wall ties. So this came to light when a wall collapsed in Scotland, nearly killing some kids. They found it in five other schools. The bricklayers weren't supervised. The bricklayers weren't of the, the appropriate competence. This is what happens. We're building a new nuclear power station in Somerset at the moment. Um, we're already, we're not even out the ground and people are worrying where the people are gonna come from to build it. Can't get people to, to physically turn up to do the work. The biggest infrastructure project in Europe, Crosswell, 16 billion UK Pounds. It's been a, a, a poster child project for the infrastructure industry in the UK. Politicians all over it saying this is fantastic, we're going to be on time, we're going to be on budget. And guess what? The engineering part of this job was absolutely exemplary. So some real innovation, um, some really interesting stuff around digital and off-site manufacturing. And guess what? As soon as it becomes a construction project, fitting out the stations above ground with soldier ants and hundreds of workers doing all of the fitting out, the M&E, etc., it's all starting to go wrong because it's just another construction project. So now they're about to blow the budget, they're probably going to be late. Um, just when it becomes a labour intensive operation again, not able to be done for a tunnel boring machine or precast tunnel linings, it's just a guy wiring something up, becomes a point of failure yet again. Piers, you have some problems here in Australia as well. You have some house building issues, your New South Wales defect bond scheme. You have some serious legacy issues around leaking homes, poor quality build. So in house building and then in infrastructure delivery, this is a report from Infrastructure Australia, only half of your projects are delivered with a success rate, 
52%, and you're struggling to deliver major pieces of inf infrastructure. And I've just chosen your broadband rollout here as an example. So again, I think there's big commonality here around the issues that we're facing. Uh, you had a fire, a lacrosse fire in Melbourne a few years ago, which um, sadly became very real for us last summer when we had um, the tragedy that happened at Grenfell Tower at lacrosse. Uh, luckily, no one died. But it started a debate about fire safety and construction skills and competencies and, and uh, signing off work. When 70 plus people die in the UK, then um, people start to ask questions. And it's just a tragedy that it's taken that for people to ask the questions we should have been asking many, many years ago. Uh, and what's coming out of that now is a building regulation review in the UK. So Dame Judith Hackett is undertaking a major review of our building regulation standards. This is a flowchart of how the building regulations work in the UK. So is it any surprise that no one's actually adhering to what they're supposed to be doing because no one knows what they're doing? But the politics that come into play here is really important as well. So you have a UK government not wanting to overregulate but also politically sensitive to the tragedy that's happened at Grenfell and being able to make promises to future housing occupants or actually just anyone in buildings that they're in safe buildings. So there's this fine line between over-regulating and actually creating a fit-for-purpose um, self-regulating system. What I think is going to come out of this, irrespective of those two routes that may be chosen, is that the process, the skill level and the competency level that we will need in our industry, particularly for life safety elements of construction, but it might go beyond that, are all going to increase. The bar is going to be raised in a way that we haven't seen um, for a long, long time around building regulation standards, just at a time when we're losing more workers than we're gaining. So it's not just about headcount, it's the competency. So the available labour force to do certain parts of work on certainly residential buildings going forward in the UK is going to be cut by implication. And what you're also going to see is a big, big lift in compliance and monitoring and enforcement. So what you've got at the moment, and I've already shown you lots of examples, no one's quite sure what's going into our jobs. A load of people are turning up on site. There's some drawings that you'd build to. If you're lucky, you get it done in the corners of the drawings. If you're not, then you get something that gets covered up and you're not quite sure. We've also got really clear examples in the UK of falsification of records and sign off and certification. So this isn't just about you know, bad luck or whatever. This is actually about falsification. People taking it upon themselves to sign off gas safety certificates, electrical records, um, swapping photographs of one thing for another. And I'm talking major players in our industry, tier ones, major consultants, all involved and implicated in this. So we have some big issues that I do not believe are just UK alone. We have a cultural issue in our industry, which has been left, left to fester for far too long. So what did I talk about in summary? I had 10 recommendations in my, my report. I'm not going to go through them now, but just to three, three key themes. We need some leadership and we need some institutional reforms for how we do construction if we're going to make any difference. And we need to integrate clients closer together with the industry. And the government needs to be a part of that as well as a bit of a glue between industry and clients. We need a productivity-led change agenda, getting innovation to dictate those future skills. Don't let industry ask for more bricklayers and plasters because that's what they feel they need today. Yes, we do need them, but that shouldn't drive the agenda. We need what we need here and now, but we need one eye on what we're going to need in four or five years' time because we need to start training them now. Productivity-led agenda has to influence what that course content and spectrum looks like. And the government needs to play a role as a client and as a policy setter for trying to accelerate some of those changes. And I'll, I'll come on to what that looks like. And I suppose everything in my report comes down to two basic things that I talk about a lot. One is we need to increase the level of pre-manufactured value in our projects. Pre-manufactured value, quite simplistically, is the level of value add in the final construction cost, which is delivered prior to its delivery at the work face. So it's consolidation. It could be raw materials and components. It could be sub-assemblies. It could be volumetric. It could be panelised systems. The more value you're adding before it arrives at its final place, the higher the pre-manufactured value. It's expressed this as a percentage. And we need more integrated delivery models. My hypothesis is if you go to one without the other, you won't change your industry. You need to attack it on those two fronts. You need to change the integration model, and you need to change the physical way in which we build, and you need to meld them together. If you think, talk about collaboration off to one side and think about collaborative contracts without attacking the physical way we build, you will fail. If you go to off-site manufacturing and use traditional adversarial contract forms, you will fail. Personal opinion, but that's what I'm saying.
Why do we suffer all the problems we do in our industry? And why do I, do I come up with that hypothesis there of how we're going to attack things? Because I think there's four things that lead to all of the failure that we have through design, procurement and construction. We design everything from scratch. Every single job we do within reason is bespoke design from first principles, again, to respect a particular site condition, blank sheet of paper, just start from scratch. We're too site labour intensive, I've already covered that. We're too fragmented vertically, client to tier one, to tier two, to tier threes. Every transaction is inefficiency and waste and inappropriate risk transfer. And we're also horizontally fragmented. So we work in silos, we have design silos, we have trade silos. No one, there's very few general contractors who employ multi-trade workers now. Certainly in the UK that's gone. We now have specialists who work in silos. And every single interface between those horizontal silos is a point of weakness in mismanagement. The success for me is approaching high pre-manufactured value. So dealing with your bespoke design and your site labour intensity. If you increase your pre-manufacturing, you address those first two issues. And if you integrate your procurement models, and this ultimately comes down to procurement, you deal with the second two around fragmentation. So you have to be able to address all four of those points through the two strategies that I've outlined. And you have to have a digital thread. So the thing I haven't spoken about yet is digital. Digital has to be the bit that glues all this together. Technology and the use of digital is the mechanism by which we're going to bind this all together. And what do I mean by increased levels of pre-manufacturing? Well, a lot of people talk about BIM. And I'm not a BIM evangelist. I'm a digital evangelist. And there's a very subtle difference between building information modelling and digital engineering and, and digital construction. My view is what I see at the moment is people talking about BIM, with its 3D modelling, 4D schedule loaded, 5D cost loaded, then putting it through a conventional building contract, and then analog construction on site with hundreds of workers building in a normal way, analog. Digital not to be seen other than just maybe verification of final install. For me, that is not the future of our industry. And if you attempt it, <laughs> it's lipstick on a pig, to coin the phrase. So an important differentiation. I'm very pro-digital. I'm all about technology, but I'm not about BIM. And for me, BIM in the UK certainly has become, it's a mean, it should be a means to an end. It should be, it's a, it's a technology platform. It's a collaboration platform. It's a common data platform. But certain evangelists out there have, got, have, have taken it so seriously, it's become the end, not the means. It should be an enabler. There's other things we need to be focusing on that BIM then un unlocks if we use it in the right way. So it's a pure matter of emphasis for me on getting this right. And where we're going with pre-manufacturing in the UK, I hope, is actually not just about off-site in the way that you might understand it, around modules, around panelised systems. At, oh, both of those are absolutely part of the future, don't get me wrong. But there's a wider approach here called delivery platform thinking that many of you will be aware of from the automotive sector, where we talk about construction as manufacturing. So thinking differently around design for manufacturing and assembly, DFMA in the true sense, not reverse engineering a system into an architect-led scheme where after it's got planning consent and you have to put a square peg in a round hole, hole you, de you design with a kit of components and you have a common backbone of, of commonality, if you like, on certain parts of the building. This is a really important document that was published middle of last year um, by Digital Build Britain. Um, authored by a business called Bryden Wood. Some of you might have come across Bryden Wood here in Australia. Jamie Johnston, I know, was out in uh, Melbourne uh, late last year. Jamie and I collaborate on quite a lot of stuff in the UK. J Jamie is advancing some really interesting thinking around delivery platform thinking. And what's happened is that the government in the UK has picked up on this. So it's a kit of parts, mass customizable. You're looking at increasing your pre-manufactured value, which is the, on the right-hand side, it's the Y-axis. Um, and what at the moment is happening is most people are going straight to volumetric at the top, but actually there's very little capacity in the UK for volumetric. It's not, it's an immature market. The real opportunity is to move to the top right. So it's you're using elements of panelisation and volumetric, but increasing capacity by open sourcing elements of the component supply chain. And you open source components um, by uh, effectively having a language, a delivery platform language for different assets, whether it be residential, whether it be social housing, built to rent, multifamily, whether it be uh, student accommodation, you have a library that you work with as an architect or an engineer, and you then use that as your kit of parts, and then you, you dress the outside of the building, whatever you need to do to make it architecturally 
acceptable and from a planning context acceptable. This is different to what off-site currently stands for, certainly in the UK. We just have systems that then are reverse engineered into existing designs. Mass customization is the, the real opportunity here, in my view. Integrated procurement, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is business as usual. Tier one at the top, let's say Carillion, and put a cross for it afterwards. Um, lump sum contractor, Carillion, was brought into a client who pays Carillion, then uh, Carillion pays 20 odd subcontractors, if you're lucky, on 120 day terms, by the way. Um, and that fragmentation has led to what we all know. Uh, the horizontal fragmentation I mentioned, no control, no ownership in any part of that deal map as I see it. So we, this is about disintermediation. It's a big word, but actually that's what our challenge is now. Uh, this is about getting back to who does the work and avoiding people sitting as intermediaries who are actually taking our, our process backwards by not adding value. Everyone needs to add value in this deal map, not just sit there as a transactional broker, taking 2% or 3% off the top, not paying people. With other, it's other people's money that they're funding their businesses with. That is not the future. And Carillion, if nothing else, has now got major tier ones in the UK re-examining their business models to the extent that I would not be surprised if you see a series of large contractors reduce their turnover next year and look at reining back their exposure, looking at risk differently. Um, I still don't think they get it in many respects, and I don't want to overgeneralize here, but there is a cultural issue with the tier one model, which is revenue led, it's cash flow led, it's not fee based. I see the future moving towards more of a professional services model for, con for contra constructors, integrators, not contractors. Even the word contracting implies something that actually you know, is, is a nonsense. We should be constructors, we should be building things, we should be managing that process. And that's really where this diagram comes from, which is around more integrated working. And alliancing is really where I see the future. So there's a big piece of work going on in the UK at the moment around procurement and standard models of procurement. So much as the UK has moved towards design and build over the last 20 years, we now have a move towards pushback on design and build as being inappropriate. So alliancing is now coming to the fore. So just to quickly cover government policy. So in November last year, the Chancellor of the Exchequer published his budget. Um, and not long after that, the UK announced an industrial strategy. And what was buried in the small print, this was probably one of the biggest announcements affecting construction in the UK for 40 years. And for those of you who can't read it, it was effectively a presumption towards modern methods of construction and off-site manufacturing by five government departments for all of their CapEx programmes by 2019. So they're effectively, the government's saying, we need to take a lead here. We can see the industry starting to really suffer long-term problems. We're not sure if the private sector alone can initiate change in our industry. We see a big debate around productivity. We see a big risk around lack, lack of labor moving forward. We have to start leading from the front. So effectively, the Department of Transport, so all of the road and rail programs moving forward, the Ministry of Defense, so all major defense assets in, in the UK main, mainland, Department of Health, so all new hospitals and clinics, Department for Education, all new schools, and the Ministry of Justice, so all new prisons, will be built using off-site manufacturing by 2019. That is a massive sea change in policy that has come at a time when actually, with that little bit of initiation, Government won't change our industry alone. It needs to be an initiator. That's what I said in my report. Just do things a slightly different way, and then actually the private sector can benefit from that because what this will do is it will reshape the supply chain in the UK. You will have increased levels of pre-manufacturing. You'll have component libraries starting to be established for different assets that then start crossing over into private sector work. And so, as I said, procurement is a big, big topic at the moment in the UK. So everyone's got onto the fact that actually this Carillion situation is being propagated by poor procurement lump sum risk transfer, inappropriate risk transfer, et cetera, et cetera. So just to come to the closing bit of my presentation around what does this mean for Western Sydney, I thought I'd just share a quick case study on a leading client in the UK, it happens to be a private sector client, it's privately funded, but it's regulated, which is Heathrow Airport. So Heathrow Airport um, is effectively looking to undergo a massive expansion programme, a third runway, big, big redevelopment of its terminal buildings and ancillary infrastructure. And obviously here in Western Sydney, you have your own plans for a new airport. But it's just interesting to see how Heathrow have approached this. And what they're gonna do is effectively um, think differently around the build. High levels of pre-manufactured value, doing more off-site, using logistics hubs remotely from the location in London because there's not enough workers to build this programme. 
And that's what this is stemmed from. There's not enough workforce of the appropriate productivity to assure an outcome in London. So effectively, that's led to a logistics hub strategy, which will be driven by four identified locations across the UK. There's currently 60 locations um, tendering um, for that uh, opportunity, not financially. M money doesn't come into this. This is about proposition. It's about what's your thinking, how you're going to get industry collaborating in your region, how, what's your, your physical facilities look like, what's your transportation logistics to get parts of the buildings, etc., down to Heathrow. And effectively, this will reshape economic growth on the back of a major infrastructure programme. It will be driving skills, demand-led skills. So this programme alone will reshape course content in each of the chosen logistics hub locations. So you'll have universities and FE institutions reshaping their training programmes because what Heathrow is going to ask for, and it will be a client asking for something differently, will need different skills. So it's already starting to influence that agenda in, in the education sector. And it's also about economic rebalancing. So taking London and the southeast of England as an economic powerhouse, let's spread some of that growth to other areas where there's a workforce actually that's available, where actually the economy needs it. And you know, it's actually cheaper in many respects because the cost of living is cheaper. So the embedded labour costs in these locations enables a benefit for Heathrow. And what's happening is, and this is all very embryonic, so they are currently on a roadshow. Heathrow is travelling the UK, visiting all these prospective logistics hubs. They're looking at a draft packaging strategy, which splits broadly between infrastructure and buildings. So there's obviously a lot of work around the runways and the pavements, major structures, bridges, tunnels, um, drainage, uh, culverts, etc. Um, and then there's buildings. There's various terminal buildings, there's various ancillary buildings, etc. Um, and effectively, the pre-manufacturing drive will, will span both. So you might think that things like major civil engineering, how can you pre-manufacture that? It's just concrete poured in a hole but that's not the way Heathrow are going to do it. They're going to be using pre-casting. They're going to be using um, minimal wet trades, minimal temporary works. They will be looking to do as much as possible in all elements of their building, infrastructure and buildings, remotely. So they have more predictable outcomes. They've got scale to enable the price point to be at the correct point. So this is about a business imperative, all about productivity. As I've said, you know, the litany of reports out there, including mine, calling on people to change that. You know, that goes without saying. And what's really interesting is the engagement model is not about tier ones. So just, this has all happened to break at the time when Carillion's playing out in the press in the UK. So Heathrow launched a couple of weeks ago in London and saying, we're not going to talk to main contractors. We're going to talk to specialists and we're going to have an integrator who's going to bring all this together. And we might have some main contractors for some of the civils work that actually there's no other way of doing it if there is in situ work. But ultimately, most of this will be integrated. So it might be main contractors that are the integrator, but they have to change their skill set. They certainly have to change their financial model because it won't be pass-through, like turnover-based. It'll be fee-based. And then it's the engagement with the people that physically do the work, including manufacturing supply chain remotely, and all driven by a benefits case, which is financially driven ultimately, as well as social value, economic rebalancing, et cetera, et cetera. There's an emerging strategy here, which is the, one of the boldest strategies I've seen around disrupting delivery on a major programme uh, in the UK for a long, long time. And it's come just at the right time, in my view, in terms of leading from the front in our industry. And it's all co-created with the supply chain. So Heathrow are not presuming anything. They're going out into the manufacturing supply chain, saying, can you do this, can you do that? They're looking at SME engagement. So massively important around getting to directly into the SME supply chain, talking directly two or three levels down to influence what they specify and how they design. So it, engage, it actually maps onto the SME supply chain. And it's done it before. So Heathrow, has, uh, Terminal 5 was one of the most advanced buildings in Europe in terms of how it was delivered. It was high pre-manufactured value. They used a consolidation centre just over the M25 in, uh, next to the airport. But this takes it to a whole different scale. So from a PMV of maybe 50%, I'd be surprised if the PMV at Heathrow is less than 70%. So nearly two thirds, over two thirds of everything done remotely. And this is the final assemble rather than in situ construction. So, in closing, so I think modernise or die, it's certainly started a debate. You can agree with my conclusions or not, that's not really the point. It's about the debate. It's about the debate around how important it is we do something now. And I do believe there are generic issues that we're, we're grappling with. We have those new drivers for change that I spoke about, discontent as well as the sort of inevitability of what, what's coming. Um, and we have this great opportunity around technology. Why the hell don't we? harness it once and for all and just 
do things differently. Government policy can be important, and we're certainly the beneficiaries of that in the UK. I'm conscious that your governmental structures here in Australia are a bit more complicated in terms of Commonwealth government, state, federal government, but it has shown itself to be massively important in the UK. So anything you can do in Australia to replicate that, even at state level, with politicians supporting around policy is really important in my view. And as I said, specifically from a Western Sydney airport perspective, some interesting thinking around how you assure your outcomes through, and also leave a legacy. Because importantly, this is about leaving a legacy for your Western Sydney economy and your industry around hubs, logistics hubs, different ways of delivery that go beyond the lifestyle of the project. You've got a major programme here that can really drive a long-term change in construction in this location. So, that's me. Thank you for listening. Thanks,